it definitely was. We were happening. It was going. Garage was going on at the same time Studio 54 was. So when Studio 54 was outside with picking people to get in. You know, we had our own crowd outside trying to get in, but we weren't picking people. Those were members and their guests. Yeah. And everybody was alive. As long as you had a membership, you could, you could get in, you know, and sometimes members would pick up people at the corner. Mm -hmm. But we weren't scrutinizing like that. As long as you, you know, you didn't look like... Crazy, yeah. You was going to make some trouble and stuff like that, and the members were responsible for who they were bringing in. All right, today is Saturday, May 18th. Who are we speaking with? We're speaking with Joey Llanos. <laughs> Who's Joey Llanos for those that don't know? Joey Llanos. Let me see. Joey Llanos. Uh, Where were you born? I was born in Manhattan. Okay. I was born in Manhattan, uh, raised in the Bronx. What part? What part of BS? Um, I want to say the South Bronx, but it was basically like the Tremont Avenue, Southern Boulevard area. All day. <laughs> Tremont and Concourse. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, basically there, you know, playing scalesies on the street, you know, brought up in a real cohesive black and Hispanic neighborhood, you know, it was real together, you know. But, um, miss those days, man. You know, I live in the suburbs now, so it's... Nothing like that. Nobody talks to each other. Everybody stays in their house. Exactly. Exactly. You know, but I had a, it got crazy, so I had to pull. You know, I had my son in the Bronx, uh -huh. and I had to pull. You know, I had to move the family out of the Bronx. It, it got a little. Uh -huh. It turned testy. It turned. You know, it turned real quick. But I still love it, man. I still go back there and walk around and mix with the people. You know? Fordham Road, all that. I miss that. Um, where are your parents from? My mother is, uh, was Italian from Naples, white Italian, and my father was a uh, very dark-skinned Puerto Rican, Puerto Rico, so kind of got the Franco Harris thing going on. You know? um, do you have brothers and sisters? I have four sisters. On my mother's, no, three sisters, two sisters on my mother's side, two sisters with my my dad. Gotcha. You know, so kind of like a mix. A know, mixed family. Uh, what do they call it? What's that? The Brady Bunch type? Brady shit, Bunch. But, yeah. On a smaller scale. Got you. Uh, and then tell me about what kind of music did you hear in the house growing up? Oh, my God. Um, my father was a Latin singer. Really? Yeah, he sang with the El Glen Combo. He sang with wow. uh, Senor Rodriguez. Wow. And um, Ray Santiago. He sang. He sang with a lot of a lot of Latin bands. You know, that's how my mother met him. Because um, my mother used to go out dancing, you know, to the Copa and stuff like that. She met my father, fell in love, and she learned Spanish. So she can hang with him. <laughs> you know, wow, that's good love. Speak no English, you know. Wow. And uh, the rest is history. Three kids later, you know. And uh, but yeah, I, I grew up to listening to uh, Latin music because mm -hmm. my father was Latin music, and my mother was Italian, so I was listening to Mario Alonzo and all those guys, you know, mm -hmm. some country western, Hank Williams Jr. and Perry Como, and my sisters growing up, I was listening to the Beatles, mm -hmm. so it was a very well mixed of music, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I got into jazz early, I was listening to, as a teenager, Chick Corea, you know, Al Demiola, the whole Return to Forever thing, you know, mm -hmm. I was doing that. My mother got me off the street by uh, putting me in the drum and bugle corps. Mm. So I, that got me out of the Bronx, you know, because the corps would compete uh, cross country for mm. the whole summer. So I, by May, I was off the streets in the Bronx because she wasn't, she didn't want to have me. That was during the time when the gang Gangs. was really strong. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's where my martial arts. A career started because of the gang you know you couldn't be in the gang without knowing how to fight so mm -hmm. everybody was in karate school and stuff at that time 
you know, but the drum corps really pulled me out. Mm -hmm. And that's when my uh, percussion career started, you know. So I was well versed with beats, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but the, the the drum corps also got me to meet uh, Mark Riley, who was uh, the news radio host for WLIB at mm -hmm. the time, yeah. sister station for WBLS. Yes. He was marching in the drum review club that I had joined in Long Island. So he was in the in the percussion section. I ended up in the percussion section, and um, he. Uh, before that, I was marching in in New, a New Jersey core called the Bridgman Drum and Bugle Corps. I want to say their name because they're very famous. Yeah, yeah. I'm proud of being with them. We won national titles and shit like that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, long story short, you can only do that until you're like 21 years old. Okay. So, when I finished that, they have you have to go into like a senior division. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like weekend warrior type shit. So, mm -hmm. I joined that. It was the same uh, drum uh, percussion organizer. Mm -hmm. So that's where I met Mark Riley. So and um, the core was was not really racially diverse, mm -hmm. you know. So. The black people kind of got to know each other really quick. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I met Mark, and uh, we we formed a, an organization called the Macumba Deaf Squad and shit. You know, wow. <laughs> within the core. Wow. You know, because they had they had some thing about you know initiating members and doing crazy shit. You know, mm -hmm. ripping their underwears. And so we got together. Said that shit ain't happening to mm -hmm. us. Man. We, we formed the Macumba Death Squad, and Mark wrote a memo and sent it out to the whole course. And you know, like, kind of like, basically, like, you fuck with us, this is what you're gonna get. I love it. <laughs> you know, and um, that was in 1979, and the name of the core was the Long Island Sunrises, mm. which I loved because you know I, I only marched with them for one year. That one year, and we won uh, the Drum Corps. Uh, Associates Championship and Percussion. I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. But during that time when we used to rehearse, Mark would always tell me, because I wasn't really a hangout kid, you know. Mm -hmm. I would hang out in the Bronx and go to, you know, the Epica or Herpes Triangle and shit where Louis you started and all of that. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> hold up, rewind, rewind, rewind. I caught that. Yo. There's an area in the Bronx, man, where there was like three clubs i don't remember the names yeah. exactly of the clubs yeah but um the nickname was and they they would call it herpes triangle because you come you go to one club and leave that club and go across the street to the other one to leave that one go across the street to the other one and if you was crazy you never knew what you would end up with you know yeah but um <laughs> Anyway, talking to Mark, man, Mark, Mark was like, yo, you got to come check this club out, man. It's called Paradise Garage and shit. I said, really? It's cool, man. I mean, at that at that time, I was, I was 20, 19, 20 years old. Wow. So he says, come to Paradise Garage, man. I said, cool, I want to go. He says, all right, we'll go after practice. So what time? It opens up at midnight. I was like, what? <laughs> midnight? Hell no, I'm sleeping, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, long story short, I ended up, uh, I decided to go with him one night. Mm -hmm. You know, he took me down, it was a Saturday night, introduced me to Larry, brought me, when I first got into the garage, you know, the whole aura of just walking into the place, I'm like, what is this it's a garage? Noel was at the front door. Paul Stewart was at the front door. Um, he was a security before me. And um, I was just like in awe. I said, where the hell are you taking me? It's like a truck around this shit, you know? And then you step in, you gotta step over, because it's one of those sliding door, wooden garage doors with a little door in the middle that opened up, and you had to step over and then go in there, and it was all dark, and there were pin spots leaning up to another door, where you had to show your ticket, it was crazy. 
So he took me, he said, don't worry, man, just come, just check it out. And when you get in there, you can't really hear the music, but you can hear the bass going, from that, because it was upstairs. Yeah. So you, after you give your ticket in, you turn the corner, you end up on the ramp where they have the uh, airport runway lights were going. Mm -hmm. So that was like, oh, God, you know, so go up the ramp, go inside, and I wasn't really, I wasn't, I never hung out and seen men dancing together up on each other before. You know, so I was like, yo. <laughs> I said, yo, Mark, what, what, are, you, what are you doing, man? Why, why did you bring me here? But he says, relax, man. Just watch, hang out, listen to the music, blah, blah. I said, okay. He said, I'll be back. I'm going to the bathroom. I said, okay. So I back my shit up against the wall. And... <laughs> Now, not homophobic, but I was Your 19 first time. years old. Yeah, his first time 19. You know, yeah. so, and there was, you know, the costumes, and this was out, and that was out, and rubbing, and all of that, and and the music was, was amazing, you know, the sound was amazing. It was just so, the whole experience was just so overwhelming that, what made me calm down was that nobody was paying attention to me. Mm. Nobody gave a shit, you know. I was a, I was the only one that gasped of what the fuck was going on and right. shit, you know. Right. Yeah. They didn't give a fuck. They yeah. were like, you know, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nobody was really paying attention to anybody but the music, the fun they they were having, their yeah. own experience. What, yeah. what, what. The music was doing for them, mm -hmm. you know, and they didn't care. They were dancing, it literally, like you know, not, you know, that phrase, you know, like nobody's watching you, you yeah. know. They were dancing like nobody was watching this shit, you know. So by that time, Mark Riley came back and got me, took me up to the booth. When I got, when I came up to the booth, I came into that area where the, the friends hang out. So you could see, you know, the lighting is kind of like eye level and you could look down on the dance floor. That was a whole amazing experience just to see, you know, 4,000 people, you know, just like a heartbeat. Yeah. You see, you know, doing that. I was like, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. So I was like, this is amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. And then finally we got the okay to go into where the uh, console was, where Larry was. You know, he was Larry and Mark Riley were friends, so he introduced me as uh, Joey, he's my friend, da 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 da. He's an electrician, so, you know. So Larry's eyes went, oh, electrician. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody does, when you find somebody, yeah. you know. And I was like, but before I got to, to meet him, he was, like he had one hand on this box that was later on I re I realized that it was just an extension of the lighting uh, console Got you it. Know, it was like a remote control okay so whenever he wanted to he because there was a lighting console basically the same size as the sound console mm -hmm. in the garage mm -hmm. where the lighting man would work and when Larry felt whatever was moving him mm -hmm. He would hit a switch, and that would cut. The light guy would go dead, and Larry had all the control. Yeah. So Larry was playing with the with the isolator, and <laughs> the lights with with his other hand. You know, wow. kind of like a piano player would have like two different. Yeah. You know things. Larry was doing that, so the lights were doing, and the sound was going, and. He was doing it like it wasn't nothing, and I was like, "Holy shit!" That was I never seen a DJ work before, you know. So mm -hmm. that's basically was my first experience of what a DJ was and what he did. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me started, you know. That's what made me buy turntable because after that I, I met David Pino because mm -hmm. David Pino was the security in the booth for Larry. Uh -huh. You know, he was uh, had nothing to do with playing records. Mm -hmm. He didn't play records. He was. David Pino was a hairdresser at the time, mm -hmm. and security for Larry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met him, 
and um, he was working later on. I think he started working for Judy Weinstein at a for the record. Yes. So that's how I got into the vinyl, you know, mm -hmm. through him, mm. you know, and meeting Judy and the, eventually I uh, became a member of the pool and I was getting records. I was like, oh, I want records and shit. You know, records are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> how do you get records? Yeah, yeah. I said, you get records for free? Yeah. <laughs> shit, yeah. You know? So I, I started learning about all of that. And um, then when I met Larry, and he, like I said, when Mark uh, said who I was and what I did, Larry was like, oh, I need circuits for air conditioning for my amplifiers, da 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 back here, you know, so he started showing me stuff where he needed work and shit, you know, <laughs> during the party and shit, you know, party going on, boom, boom, there's like 4,000 people on the floor, he's showing me like, yeah, I want to put another air conditioner back here, but I need a circuit and all of this, so I'm like, yeah, sure, you know. So I did that. That's how I got to know, got close to Larry. Okay. You know, because um, Larry wasn't an easy person to get close to. You know, everybody's trying to get close to him because yeah. he was, you know, he was playing on the biggest, baddest toy in the city. Mm -hmm. You know, it's every DJ's dream was to be like a Larry LeVan with a toy like that, you know? Yeah. So uh, I did that job for him. And I did a couple of other electrical jobs. So that brought me into the club, like during the week when we were tweaking and sound, stuff like that. So then he asked me, why don't you, you know, would you mind, you know, doing some other work? Mm -hmm. I said, sure, you know, sometimes, you know, which involved rewiring mm -hmm. and um, changing out drivers and replacing diaphragms on the bullet tweeters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I got to learn a lot of stuff too. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't, you know, I was mostly electrical. I didn't do sound work until I started working at Paradise Garage and shit. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, being around that van, okay, I bought some turntables and I started buying some records and then David DePino would give me some records and I was sort of building my record collection, you know, from then, mm -hmm. which is now over 50,000 records sitting in my garage. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> you know, so who'd have thought? And, um, yeah, man, it's, and that, and that's, it's just been a crazy ride from then to now, you know? I, I would have never thought that. David DePino either, because he was a hairdresser. I was an electrician. We didn't know nothing about DJing or, there was no intent yes. for us even wanting to be a DJ. You know, it's just being, in that environment and under that influence. And we said, you know, I'll, I'll try that. You know, David's first DJ gig, I think was, I think uh, he was flown out to India to open up a club. Mm -hmm. He never played anywhere before in his life and he was opening up a club in India, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, I'm, he's got crazy stories. David's got a memory like an elephant, so yeah. he can tell you stories. Yeah. But, um, yeah, man, I was just thinking about that. The way that started is crazy, you know, to now, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, that's how that's how uh, my relationship personally with Larry uh, developed over uh, work, mm -hmm. you know. And then just spending more time during the week. It's all oh, I want to. I want to re rewire this. I want to move these speakers and time align this. And, Mm -hmm. I want to rewire the whole room and, mm -hmm. and so it turned into um, a job of just maintaining the sound mm -hmm. you know instead of because Richard Long would hit you over the head for service calls oh really so, oh yeah it's any sound guy mm -hmm. you know so I was I secured a job at uh, security mm -hmm. because the security was in transition Okay. You know, the Paul Stewart was moving out. Mm -hmm. And I was, I knew Paul Stewart from the martial arts world. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Because we were both martial artists. Mm -hmm. And um, so basically everybody that hung around mm -hmm. Paul Stewart was a martial artist. You know, Henry Rodriguez and Wolfie and those guys, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that's how I kind of moved into that security thing. You know, Michael Brody just like, 
Joe, you want a job? I wow. said, yo. Because I would be there. I came back after my first time that Mark Riley brought me there. Mm -hmm. I came back the next week. Oh, so you was, it was instant. He was just like. I came back the next week on my own. Wow. You know, because once I found out that my martial arts buddies were there. Yeah. I would come down and hang out with them so I wouldn't have to pay mm. to get in. So yeah. I would hang out in the front door. Peter Lambros was part of security at that time, rest in peace. So I would help them out mm -hmm. with security in the front, you know, searching bags mm -hmm. or watching the door when they stepped away mm -hmm. or whatever. So that's how I moved into that spot. And then eventually I took over as head of security because they both left. Mm -hmm. And since I was already going through the motions of doing it, and Michael was checking me out for a while to make sure that I wasn't going to beat up on the gay people and nothing yeah, like that, yeah, or I exactly. wasn't homophobic. By that time, I was in, uh, you know, yeah. I was indoctrinated yeah. into Paradise Garage, yeah, yeah. you know? Because mm -hmm. I was one of those kids that grew up in the Bronx and went to an all boy parochial school, mm -hmm. you know, trade school. And like, if you was gay in high school at that time, you had to hide, yeah. you know? It turned out, it, it gave me, a, you know, it opened my eyes and, and enlightened me about the gay community that, you know, why be me to these people or why treat them any other kind of way because it really didn't make sense, mm -hmm. you know. At that time, you're kind of like, you're following the herd. Oh, that person is gay, man. Let's let's throw rocks at them or let's be mean to them or let's gay bash or let's do this, you know, when you're a teenager. And you're hanging out with a crew. You kind of go with, with the crew, you know, even though you may think it's not the right thing, but you want to be recognized by the crew. So, you know, you'll say stupid things and stuff like that. So after a while, I was like, yo, I, I didn't meld with that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I worked in construction. So in construction, you couldn't talk about gay stuff or shit because I was straight yeah. up straight yeah. and narrow shit, you yeah, know. Yeah. But I didn't care at that time because you know, many people like Michael Brody and David DePino and Larry Van and, and really getting to know what type of Noel and what type of people they are. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I work at a gay club on the weekends and everybody on my job. <laughs> you work at a gay club? I said, yeah. It was a problem. They couldn't. Yeah. It couldn't, they didn't really have anything like coherent to say, you know, other than, you know. So after a while, you know, they, they stopped messing with me. And then it's crazy because I came from that world, right, of mm -hmm. the homophobic side, mm -hmm. you know, from the way you were brought up mm -hmm. and what the Bible says and what, they, what society says, you know, the expectations of the society that you live in. Mm -hmm to where the Paradise Garage totally opened my eyes to people or people, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I got married in 1987, mm -hmm. it was when the garage closed, mm -hmm. my whole wedding party was gay. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you look at my wedding pictures, yeah. David DePino, Noel, Bobby Falas from the courtroom. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? And uh, the only person, my best man wasn't gay, JR. Uh -huh. You know. But uh, some people won't question that and shit, but <laughs> <laughs> he'll tell you he wasn't gay. Uh -huh. Talk to me about. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about Larry? The m biggest misconception. Um, the biggest misconception is that he was the nicest person in the world. Because <laughs> he wasn't. Mm. Unpack that. <laughs> you know, he was, he was, he was nice to who he liked. And if he didn't like you, you were off with your head, you know? And, um, and if you, like, push back at him, he'd have you, 
ejected, you know? Oh, really? Yeah, man. Like, it was like, psh. Security get him out yeah, of Yeah, because some people, because you know how DJs are, man. Sometimes you can't have a great night every night. Yeah. And sometimes you're going to play according to your mood. And your mood ain't going to be exactly what everybody else's mood is on the floor. Yeah. Some of these, some of these queens, mm -hmm. they ain't having it. They be on the floor like, are you going to play something? <laughs> That gonna make me dance, and if you did that and Larry caught you, oh no! I get, I get the Joey get up here. That one, you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta. What do you mean I gotta go? So Larry said you gotta go. What'd you do? You know, or somebody else would be like. Giving Larry the finger because they ain't like what he was playing. And Joey, could you come up here? What is it? I used to hate that. I said, come up. I said, you want me to throw somebody else out because they gave you the finger? Get him out. I said, all right. Sorry, you have to go. I'm sorry, but I paid my money. To <laughs> and what could you do? Because Larry was the king. Yeah, he can't. It's Larry's house. Larry's I said, house. Larry's. Larry was, at, of the time, was the black Richie Rich. Ooh, what does that mean? That meant that he was, Michael Brody was his father. Mm. Got you. This case, Michael Brody was like, I had a blank checkbook to do sound maintenance on the garage. Wow. Whatever Larry wanted. Whatever Larry wanted or whatever I deemed needed to be repaired or replaced. Wow. In Larry's stead. Because mm -hmm. it was like that. Mm -hmm. You know, after a while, you know, I, I, I reached that status yeah. where yeah. Larry trusted what I did or what I said, mm -hmm. you know. Of course, there were things that I have to run by him, and then he would say, I don't want to hear about that. This needs to be fixed, make sure. By the time I get there on Friday, I want everything working. Mm. I said, well, it's going to cost. I went through the time period where I was going to say, what's going to cost this? It's going to cost this? What's this? What's that? He didn't want to hear that shit. Mm. He just wanted done. Mm. So I had to make sure after Saturday night that everything was working by next Friday. Wow. And then after Friday, I have to be there that day going over everything to make sure everything was 100% for that Saturday. Mm -hmm. That was my job. You That's know, a so lot of pressure. If it meant crawling into the big, the berthas and changing out those Eminence 18s and getting all itchy from <laughs> the <there, laughs> fiberglass, mm -hmm. and, uh, that's what I had to do. Mm -hmm. Bring them to be reconed, and which was amazing. Because um, I set it up beautiful, you know, I set it up the way I would do my job in electrical. Mm. I, I had to spare everything. Oh. I had spare, I had a spare mixer. I had spare amplifiers. I had spare TADs. What's that? The, the TAD speakers that they were, at that time were $400 a driver. Mm. I had spares for every stack. Mm. I had spare bullet tweeted JBLs. I had spare uh, diaphragms to change the JBLs out. At that time, I used to change the diaphragms out myself. Mm -hmm. You know, so I ended up saving them a lot of money, mm -hmm. maintenance-wise, mm -hmm. because a lot of people would think, that's a lot of money. How could you have spare everything? But the having spare everything would, would mean if it went down, there was no downtime. You're right. If the mixer was down, we got another mixer in the back. Mm -hmm. If the amplifier, Mark Levison went down, we got another Mark Levison in the back. Mm -hmm. You know, if the BG750, <laughs> BGW750, we had, I made sure that I had at least one mm -hmm. of everything in that room. Oh, so he must have loved you because he kept it moving all the Yeah, time. so he didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. If something where something was down, I was the one that would get the shit. Mm -hmm. You know, and then... You know, because if Richard Long got the call, that's Richard Long. Yeah. He's going to charge you Richard Long dollars. Yeah. You know, I was only getting an extra $200 a week mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, which if I was smarter, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have charged Michael a lot more. Mm -hmm. But Michael was good to Michael was good. Michael Brody was good to the staff. You know, he was good to me. Mm -hmm. You know, so it never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me to to gouge him. Right. Right. It never occurred to me to steal from him. You know, if I was, I don't want to mention no names, but mm -hmm. if I was a certain person, mm -hmm. I could have had my own sound system because I could have bought anything I wanted mm -hmm. that I needed, mm -hmm. you know. But now I just made sure that the, the garage was 100% running, yeah. you know, and I was proud of that. I was happy, you know, and uh, yeah, man, you can't, some of these clubs don't even have a spare needle. Yeah. in the building yeah i went to a club one time where they told me uh they didn't even have cdjs in the house i said well how am i supposed to do the gig if yeah. you don't have cdjs yeah i said well you know i thought you would bring your own this is what the owner was telling me so i was like oh. and then you know from where i came from to hear stuff like this it makes you want to quit <laughs> doing stuff yeah you know, I no, because you were you were at the gold standard of nightclubs. It definitely was. We were happening. It was going. Garage was going on at the same time. Studio Fifty Four was so. Studio Fifty Four was outside with picking people to get in. You know, we had our own crowd outside trying to get in, but we weren't picking people. Those were members and their guests. Yeah, and everybody was alive. As long as you had a membership, you could you could get in. You know, and sometimes members would pick up people at the corner, mm -hmm. but. We weren't scrutinizing like that. As long as you, you know, you didn't look like crazy. Yeah. You was gonna make some trouble and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. the members were responsible for who they were bringing in. Mm -hmm. So we would, you know. Talk to me about doing security. What's the secret to a good security team and staff? Well, um, every club has a set of rules, mm -hmm. you know, and the city has this set of rules, and each club. Uh, if they're operating in New York City, they have to abide by certain rules, you mm -hmm. know, because they're concerned about their licenses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So as long as you, for me, um, because it was a private club, we weren't really concerned. I didn't really concern myself about drug use, mm -hmm. you know, but I would, I would enforce open gotcha. drug use. Understood. So, and then I didn't believe in uniforms. Like some clubs you would go in and they would have striped orange jumpsuits that said security on the back. Mm -hmm. um, when I got into security, I just made sure that um, whoever was on the security team was a martial artist, um, skilled in handling themselves and skilled in working autonomously. And they were informed that they you're not here to beat up the clients because it's the clients that are paying your salary. So, and then, you know, that they couldn't be homophobic, you know, sometimes it was a teaching process, mm -hmm. you know, bring them in on a Friday, Friday was straight night. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm gonna move Saturday's gay night. It's going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. You may have somebody throwing a kiss at you or mm -hmm. winking at you or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Are you going to fall apart? Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, <laughs> sounds ridiculous. So after one, you know, no, I'll, I'll be, I'll be fine. I'm good. I'm good. I got this. I got this. Yeah. So I would kind of like, you know, build, have a little apprenticeship going on, yeah. you know, to build up my my team, you know. But after a while, I had I had a great team, and then, and I would just go to, you know, just enforce the rules, you know, and go up to people and treat them like human beings. I'm saying, dude. If I could see you from across the room sniffing cocaine mm. from across a room, come on! So you don't think an underground undercover cop see you, and then that's gonna give problems to the club? Are you supposed to be a member of the club? And that's come on! If yeah. you care about your club, didn't right. you pay for a membership? Right. Yeah. Okay. So why are you doing this, which is going to endanger the club to be able to operate? Mm -hmm. So it's basically just talking to them and, 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 and making sense to them. And once they, you know, most people will be like, you're right. 
Yeah, yeah my bad. I'm cool, you yeah. know. But then you get the drug dealers in there like, like, fuck you, man. I'm going to do whatever I want. And we treated them a little different. <laughs> right? Just headlock out the club. Well, you know, we had a back staircase that was concrete steps. Oh, no. And they had to meet those. They didn't come back to sell drugs <laughs> anymore. We just put put it that way. Understood. Understood. Or their drugs were confiscated. Oh, perfect. Flush them. And... They know we get flushed, mm-hmm. but um, usually they're selling drugs for somebody else. Mm-hmm. So if you get your stuff confiscated, yeah, fucked. You got to answer to somebody else. Mm-hmm. I said, You in there? I said, Okay, this is the choice you have. Mm-hmm. You can give me the drugs, mm-hmm. or we can hold you for the police department, and we'll hand you and the drugs over to them. What you want to do? So they'll let us take the drugs, and they'll be crying and leaving. Yeah. Please, they're going to kill me. I'm Shit. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was interesting handling four thousand people and personalities and it was crazy. Walk me through a typical night of security. Like I want the detail, like what time would you get there? How big was your team? What were the different roles from the beginning of the night to the end of the night? What'd you do at the end of the night? Would you all go out to eat? Would you just go to night, go to you know, just continue the day? Would you go to sleep? Like walk us through like a day in the life of security at the Paradise Garage on a Saturday night. Well, would you take a nap before you go to the club? Like, give us all that detail. This is this is not something that um, a normal running operation would go by, mm-hmm. because the garage. I mean, like Larry entrusted me with the sound system. Mm-hmm. Michael entrusted me with the security of, of the club. Mm-hmm. You know, once he saw that his clients were taken care of and the club was, you know, we weren't in danger of being, you know, raided and caught with our pants down mm-hmm. or doing any wrongdoings or anything. Because we didn't sell alcohol, so we didn't have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. We just had to worry about them coming in and say, well, there's rampant drug use, so let's close this place down, and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, we ran, I ran that place with one other person. Are <laughs> you serious? 4,000 people. Yo, man, it was like, and um, yeah, it was me and Luis Morales, who's my uh, martial arts instructor right now. He's at, now he's Grandmaster Luis Morales, 10th degree, Okinawa and Gojiru. You know, you the United States North American representative for Okinawa and Kenshikai organization, you know? Oh shit. So but um yeah, we um when I was doing security, um there was an incident where these group these guys stole a, a yellow cab. Oh wow. They stole a yellow cab in Brooklyn and they came all the way to Manhattan and they must have figured out that this won't be long before we get caught riding around in stolen yellow cab. So they ended up on King Street and they tried to get into the Paradise Garage at that time. You know, Noel was at the door, so he calls me downstairs. Yo, these guys, straight guys, are trying to get into the club and they're trying to force their way in. So I came downstairs and explained to them again because I'm sure that Noel explained to them, this is a gay club, you don't want to be in here. This, you know, it's in here and they're gonna bother you and you know at that time you know Noel would use that language just to ward off people that's not supposed to be in there genius yeah but they were like yo we're coming in there and the guy got physical so I kind of like you know I hit him a couple of times because he put his hands on me and, and then his friend dropped back and shot at me and missed me but I took off down the block and he chased me and was shooting at me. So during that whole confusion, I just ran around the block. And I, when I got back to the club, everybody's crying at the front door, Noel and everybody, because they thought I got shot in the head. Mm-hmm. And they saw me walking, they, yo, what's going on? <laughs> you know, so um, at the end, long story short, Michael Brody says, what do you need? I said, well, I'd like to have uh, another person working with me of my choice. Mm -hmm. 
and a metal detector. Mm -hmm. So Michael went and bought one of those metal detectors that you go through at the airport at the time. So when you came in there, so we would like straight, you yeah. know. I said, because we come in, we had another crew. He hired another security crew because Michael was like, he didn't want me to get hurt. He wanted anybody to get hurt. So mm -hmm. he hired another private security that would basically just handle searching bags mm -hmm. and monitoring the people coming through the metal detectors. Mm -hmm. So they handled that. So I managed them. They would stay at the front door. So my concern was up to the party. They would handle the door. Perfect. And um, basically that was it. People on, on the actual floor was just me and Lewis, mm -hmm. me and whoever, you know, mm -hmm. there was, you know, a revolving door, depending on how long you would stay there. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael bought um, health insurance for the staff. What club does that? What? The cleanup staff had health insurance. <laughs> yeah. He asked me if I wanted health insurance. I said, I'm good, you know, because I was with Local 3. Right, right, right. IBW, I said, I'm good, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else had health insurance from the guy that swept the floor and cleaned the bathrooms to whoever. So if something went wrong, you could go to the doctor, you get your teeth checked, you, you know what I'm saying? That's how Michael cared for the staff. You know, he was he was a, a boss from heaven, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, who has a blank check to do what you need to do on yeah. your job? You know, yeah. that's, that's like movie stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, but yeah, basically that's how security-wise, you know, it was everybody was pretty well behaved, mm -hmm. you know, unless they were tripping on something and they had to be, you know, disciplined or carried out or get some air or something like that. But nobody nobody would get beat up. Yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. would it wasn't know, that kind of spot. We yeah. would just have to, you know, discipline people mm -hmm. that thought, you know, they wanted to do their own thing. I said, You can't do your own thing. No, no. This no. is a private space. So yeah. if you enjoy the party, I would come to them and tell them like this, look, if I see you again, I'm going to take your stuff and I'm going to eject you. Yeah. I said, well, why are you picking me out? I said, well, I'm picking you out because I can see you from across the room that you, you violated. Yeah, exactly. So I spoke to you once. If I have to speak to you again, that means you're not respecting what the club is about. So that means I have to treat you different. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at me like, you know, I guess they're not used to people making sense to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and then say, okay, well, if you want to enjoy the party, I'll allow you to stay here and enjoy your party, enjoy your drugs. I just don't want to see you doing your drugs. So if you see me, mm -hmm. make sure that I don't see you doing anything. And make sure nobody else sees you. Just be discreet about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's how we maintain, you know, we maintain the club. You know. No, that's great. And it, it was like that for the whole time, for, until it closed. Wow. And then what year did you start? Um, what year was it that um, he took you there the first time? 79. Wow, so wow. And I stayed till 87. Wow. Question from Kai. Uh, what are the pros and cons of maintaining and curating the legacy of the Paradise Garage? We'll start with the pros. Mm -hmm. The pros is, is just the honor mm -hmm. of, of experiencing the admiration mm. of being connected to something as as I'm going to use the word regal mm. to us yes. as that place was. You know, um, the cons is Sometimes we get beat up about a lot of things that we do. Um, from the public, mm -hmm. you know, because we like, I'm sure you've probably read, oh, why don't you progress? Why don't you play new music? Mm -hmm. Why don't you bring this new guy in and that new guy in and bring, you know? And, Everyone has an opinion, yeah. And I try to explain to them that, um, oh, oh, do we? Larry would 
would never be where you are right now. Larry would be light years ahead. And they're probably right. Mm -hmm. But um, I can't um, project or speculate or, or, or try to say that I would know what Larry would do. It would all be speculation on my part. What Larry would do, what Larry would play, what he would like. I mean, I've been around him and close to him enough to to be able to speculate that, but it would still be speculation. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, I want to keep the memory of the music that however whatever box it's fitting in I want to keep that in people's minds for generation to come that this is the music that Larry made famous during his reign at the Paradise Garage it's not about what he would have done. This is about what he did. So that you can have, you can know where it started. There's people like, like right now I'm doing a party called Seventh Heaven. Mm -hmm. That um, and I'm doing that with Douglas Sherman who now heads the loft mm -hmm. parties. And, um, and I use that to progress, mm -hmm. you know, because I say my background was Paradise Garage, and Douglas's background was David Mancuso, mm -hmm. which was I met David Mancuso, by the way, through Larry Levan. He was my first loft experience was because Larry said, "Let's go loft." <laughs> oh wow! Wait, tell us that story. What was that like? Yeah, it was. It was that was amazing, man. Larry, Larry was like, uh, I think it was the day we were still open at the garage. We did a few times. One time was when David DePino was left. We left David DePino there to playing at the uh, garage. And Larry said, look, I want to go to the loft, come with me, you know. In the middle of DJ? Well, it wasn't in the middle, it was... The beginning of the line, It was... No, 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 this was like... Six in the morning. Oh, wow. Like mm -hmm. And we, at that time, we weren't closing until like 10, 11 okay. a.m., you know. So, there was still a lot of people there. So, of course, David, David had to work. And we would, David didn't want to go to the loft anyway at that time, so... I went with him and basically he took me with him to keep him safe because I was scared. Right, so, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And I said, Loft, what's that? He says, don't worry, you'll see. And he brought me there and that's how I met David Mancuso and um, this was Prince Street, by the way. Mm. And, uh, there was, it was upstairs and downstairs. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. It was another, I was like, wow. And I was like, listen to this sound. Look at these type of tables. Da, 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 da. Larry, Larry wanted to. Um, it's kind of like in competition with David, mm -hmm. you know, because they were very close. Yeah. And um, and he would um, make a little these little improvements, and then invite David Mancuso over to hear it and stuff like that, or bring people from Lyric Hi-Fi and say. You know, how do you think it sounds? We were white noise tested. It says, and Larry would ask the guy, does it sound better than the loft? He says, yeah, it's just, when it's on the bigger scale, yeah, this sounds better. It's like, Larry's like, yes. So I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> but so-and-so said that this sounds better than you. <laughs> so it was that type of shit that was going on between him and Larry. Yeah. You know, but yeah, my loft experience was crazy, man. I went downstairs and the dancers would like doing acrobatic stuff. You know, and what did you see? Just diving on the floor. I never saw people like do so much dancing on the floor before in my life until they were wearing these 
their clothes were like designed for the stuff that they were doing. You know, baggy spinning pants. on the heads. Yeah, the baggy things. Yeah, I think they called them Weibo pants. At yes. The time. Yeah. So I saw all of that, and, and it was David was living there, cause like that one part of the room it was like a kitchen. <laughs> Who lives here? It looked like an actual kitchen. It didn't look like a kitchen for a club. Or something, mm -hmm. yeah. You know. And Larry said, yeah, this is David's house. You know, he lives here. You know, so I was like, wow, okay. And David put a record on, and that record would finish. Sometimes there was a gap in between. Sometimes there wasn't. You know, cause he, David didn't have a mixer. He had two preamps. Turn one up, turn one down. That was different to me. After watching Larry, I was like, how come he ain't mixing? How come? He says, David don't believe in mixes. <laughs> David thinks it's too much electronics between between the rec, the turntable and the speaker. He doesn't, he doesn't like a lot of shit. You know, so I said, okay, that's, that's another way of looking at it, you know. And uh, I never seen speakers like that before, the clip songs and, you know, bass reflex stuff and the fake corners and all that. At that time, David had like 16 of them. And they were stacked on one, on one on top of the other, and a pair, a pair of well, a pair. You could pay twenty thousand dollars for a pair of clip horns, corn Damn. horns, Damn. and he had double stacked, and he had the center channel with the clips bass speaker, and he, it was crazy. So he, he said, oh, we got that money, but <laughs> it was big money for a sound, wow. you know, and. Uh, yeah, man, that was my experience meeting David Mancuso, man, with Larry. Wow. You know. um, anyway, so we're talking about uh, pros and cons of maintaining, curating the legacy. You talk about like old versus new, and you're doing the Seventh Heaven Party with Doug Sherman. Yeah, that's that's what I used to do the progressive and move. Yeah, I play new stuff, you know, because no matter what we do, we're still you know, our parents' children. So if we're gonna do something on a different level or the next level, we're still gonna have the essence and the flavorings of, of, of our teachers, mm -hmm. you know, and our choice of music and how we put it together, even though it may be, it's not gonna be the garage classic stuff, you know, mm -hmm. so me and David, me and uh, Douglas, we do that. And uh, when we first started out, I was mixing, mm -hmm. and Doug was playing vinyl. Mm -hmm. No mixing. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting in the beginning because he had I would I would have two CDJs or I would I would have a controller and Doug would have two turntables, and sometimes that would bump, mm -hmm. you know. But because that's the way it was projected and promoted, and and people expected that. How's that gonna work? They even asked, "How's that gonna work?" I said, "Well, come and experience, mm -hmm. see, see how it works." It yeah, yeah. You know, and when you listen, when you go to the loft, yeah, you know, I mean, the loft happened way before the garage, before mixes was even invented. So you had to have some sort of maturity and patience to listen to music that way. You know, the record finished, you wait for the other record to come on. So you understood that. So um, when it did happen, it was a little shock, but they tolerated it because they respected us mm -hmm. and what me and Doug are doing. Now the party's crazy. And, and if you come to the party, um, it's full of people that never been to the loft or never been to the garage. All these new hipsters. Mm -hmm. And they're loving it. You know, but now Doug is mixing. You know, he mm -hmm. got into mixing. I said, you gotta get into mixing. You know, cause mm -hmm. it's still, you know, it's that interruption. Mm -hmm. You know, but every once in a while he'll do it. You know, just to stay connected to his his legacy. You know, uh, of the way you want to present mm -hmm. the music. Cause I mix, but I don't always mix. Some some music needs an introduction. It needs a pause. It needs space mm -hmm. to 
you know and sometimes I do that sometimes Doug does that sometimes we mix mm -hmm. and you know and people appreciate it. you know that's what and I think that's what's really um, special about the loft because it's it's not about the DJ man it's about the music exactly you know so and that's why you know that's why me and David never put our pictures on flyers mm. if we put the logo People know what that logo stands for, mm -hmm. and they know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I do my best. You know, we do our best to to pick the best venues mm -hmm. and the best sound system. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing um, the Paradise Garage reunion for the past twenty three years together, me and David. Mm -hmm. David did them before me for like seven years before that. Mm -hmm. You know, after the garage closed. Mm -hmm. And um, you're not gonna make everybody happy. Yeah. You know, um, I was trying to make the most people happy that I could. We've had the past uh, Paradise Garage reunion at Avant Gardner in Brooklyn mm -hmm. because it was the 45th anniversary of the club. Mm -hmm. So I said we need a big venue because just because people that don't normally come out okay. are saying are going to say this is the 45th year I got to go. Yeah. So I said we got to have room for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I sacrificed certain things um the the concrete floor for instance is not forgiving. Mm -hmm. You know. But um that's a mistake I'm not going to do again, mm -hmm. you know. We heard the complaints and um, we agree with them. Mm -hmm. So we've been successful at doing the party at Elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that venue. Brooklyn. I've heard of it. I haven't, I haven't been to it. Since I, since I left New York, all these venues I've never been to. Elsewhere is a multi-level uh, compartmental venue that has a main dance floor, mm -hmm. has another room. Mm -hmm. where they could do other things it has another room where they do food and then it has a roof deck mm -hmm. that can seat 500 people mm. which our clients loved especially the, the more uh, senior ma members of mm -hmm. Paradise Garage mm -hmm. they love just being having a place to sit that's comfortable and that's not choking and mm -hmm. People are not on top of you, and they can hear the music that they loved. Mm -hmm. You know, so they we've done it there three times, mm -hmm. and each time they look, the the feedback was was uh, was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the floor is not wood, mm -hmm. but it's a polished concrete, mm -hmm. so you could throw. Baby powder man, yeah, do your thing and stuff. Yeah. Avant garde was like, it looked like it was a truck garage before we got in. They had potholes and stuff like that. So gotcha. Yeah. Unforgiving. Yeah. So because the vent, uh, elsewhere venue was the closest to uh, the Paradise Garage experience in New York with the with the roof deck mm -hmm. and being able to move around because they also have an outside courtyard where they sell food oh then you have the main floor if you want to be in the main floor experience mm -hmm. you could do that there's a stage there's another room where it's air conditioned and mm -hmm. you could hang out there and mm -hmm. it's just it was a good fit for us so we were able to we did more than one two three parties then and we're gonna go back this year for we're gonna go back for uh 2023 Nice. Because that was, uh, according to the Garage Group page and the other Facebook Garage pages, mm -hmm. they were very unhappy mm -hmm. <laughs> with with uh, the last venue and they were happy that, I mean, the, the elsewhere, maximum I can get in there is maybe 1,800. Mm -hmm. And I think from now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to, uh, go bigger than that because mm -hmm. then the bigger changes the yes. things yes. and I experienced that 
this past year at Avant Garden, it just, I mean, we had Christine Wilshire, mm -hmm. and they loved her, mm -hmm. you know, and she's an amazing singer still. But the place was so big, and it was really, it was un, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't, the music was there, but it wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. There was no place to sit. Mm -hmm. It was, people were happy to be able to see the people mm -hmm. that they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it, to me, it was too commercial. It was commercial. Mm -hmm. It was commercial. The garage was never commercial. Mm -hmm. Garage is never commercial, and um, and that's the reason we don't do more than one or two events a year, because we don't want it to be commercial. We want it to be remembered as a museum piece and respected that way, and and for people to teach what it was and this is how it was, and if nobody was in your face with a cell phone trying to record you. Mm -hmm. and, there were no cell phones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was beepers and stuff. Damn, throwback, throwback. <laughs> you know, so wait a minute, I gotta go to the phone, I just got this number, you know. Yeah. So, um, that's, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Explain to people the difference between a commercial club and an underground club. A commercial club, for me, is bar ticket driven. Mm. So if you get a venue into a venue today and you don't make that guarantee, your party, if it lasts another week, is a lot. Mm. You know, it's very rare that uh, unless you get an owner that is interested in the party that you're trying to do mm -hmm. and they want to give you time to build it or they want to help you build it, mm -hmm. then maybe they'll they'll work on it with you mm -hmm. and support it for two, three months or whatever. You know, there's not a lot of venues like that. Um, good room, mm -hmm. those people there, they, they, they get it. Mm -hmm. They understand what the culture is about. They mm -hmm. understand what the DJ culture is about and what a good party is. Mm -hmm. And they support that. They definitely support us, mm -hmm. uh, me and Doug, 7th Heaven. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, venue in Brooklyn that gets it is Nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's a sound system done by SBS, uh, Shorty SBS Sounds, mm -hmm. um, which is another excellent club. Mm -hmm. And um, they, came, they cater to their crowd, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they, it's just, they just do the right thing. Gotcha. They do the right thing. And, um, I, you know, it's, you, you can tell, if you go to a venue where the owner uh, cares about the party, you can sense that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, today it's about, if you can't make the guarantee, you can't have a party here. Yeah. Or if you don't have the Instagram or TikTok footprint, you can't have a night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they don't care. Yeah. So... And that's why, you know, I'm happy. I do a party once a year or twice a year or do a party once a month. And that's the fix because we, from beginning to end, we build it, climax, come back down. Mm -hmm. And parties today, you got 20 DJs on the roster. It's crazy. It's, I was never a fan of the circus when I was a kid, so I don't go to parties like that. Yeah. You know, and some people have gone that way, mm -hmm. you know, they were like, all right, let me have 15 DJs in the other room and five DJs in this room. And this is, this is the event. Mm -hmm. And they over, they have, okay, they have a thousand, two thousand people, mm -hmm. but what is it right. really? Right. You know, it's not special to me. That's not special. That's, that's just a payday for certain people. And, you know, musically, I don't know, journey-wise, experience-wise, if there's nothing else, and the people that don't know, mm -hmm. that was the experience for them. Mm -hmm. Paradise Garage, what did they do well? What did they do not well? 
what did they do well and what did we do not well? I think the Paris Garage did it best. You know, from uh, the, the owner was the best because he recognized Larry LeVan as a young gay black artist that was to be left alone autonomously to express his creativity in that venue. And he gave him everything he needed to make it successful. So, you know, it was that um, Larry was involved with the Paradise Garage from the color of the paint to every wall that went up, to the size of every room, to the size of the stage, to the dance floor, to the lighting design, to to the flowers, to whatever, you know, if he didn't like the way something looked, it had to be changed. Larry would bring up, uh, during the party, he'd, he'd bring out a 15 foot ladder because there was dust on the mirror ball and, and dust it before the party started or during the party I said wait a minute I can't do this party dust on the mirror ball it's gonna mess up the way the light bounces off so and he could say Joe put on a record I'm going downstairs I'm cleaning the mirror ball you know because maybe you know he asked somebody to clean the mirror ball and they were like I ain't doing that shit now or oh, yeah well I'll do it myself and then you won't have a job the next day <laughs> you know you know, piss Larry off, man. We just did it. We did it with the care of the party. And Kenny Eubanks was in charge of the kitchen. Uh -huh. And he would cut up oranges. He would cut up fruit. Uh -huh. And he would mix juices and punches. And if it was summertime, um, they would put out ice, ices in the summer. And in the morning, we'll put out bagels and coffee. <laughs> it was like that. So you would have fruit all night, juice and water all night. Mm -hmm. Then in the morning, you would have bagels and coffee. Mm -hmm. And if it was sweltering out, you would have ices. You know, so, and Kenny Eubanks was in charge of that. He would go to Michael Brody and say, I think we should have this. Let me try this. And, this and, that. and Kenny ran that kitchen. You know, like clockwork, man, and he would have, I mean, it's not easy to have cut fruit available for two, three thousand people. You know, you got the kitchen that's constantly mm -hmm. running, Yeah. you know, and um, so Michael would, okay, that's what you do, do it. The artists, the decorators, would put, you know, birds of paradise flowers. We would have live, real flowers mm. around the club. No fake shit, you know. Christmas, one year they hung live Christmas trees upside down in the lounge. <laughs> they would buy a hundred Christmas trees. And, you know, Michael would do stuff like that. And, um... What they did wrong, if they did do something wrong, it would, it would, Michael would, would, would take advice and correct it. It wouldn't be that they don't give a shit, that's what it is, that's the way it is. If you don't like it, don't come here. You know, he would take letters very seriously from the membership. If they would complain about us, or if they would complain about Larry, <laughs> say, yo, Larry, they're complaining that you played fucking heartbeat fucking for an hour and shit, you know? And, but he would never interfere. Michael would never interfere with what Larry did. Mm. He wouldn't interfere with what people were specialized in doing and taking care of what the club did. You know, he would never interfere in my job. He would question, so look, this is, what I'm hearing, what happened, and he would hear us out. 
and he would make a judgment. If, if it didn't make sense, he would make a correction, you know, but if he, if you were right, he would stand behind you 100%. Mm. So, I don't think there was anything that the garage did wrong. You know, you didn't do wrong. They were very fair. Let's talk about DJ residencies. Larry had the the residency at the garage, Tony Humphreys at Zanzibar Jr. at Sound Factory, Timmy at Shelter. What happened to the residency? How important is that for a DJ building their brand and establishing their career? Um, I think the residency is a thing of the past. Unless you have a footprint like a Tony Humphreys or like a Larry Van, where you could come into a venue and this is what's this is what's behind you. You can't you can't establish a residency unless you you know you have a catalog like David Morales and so, you know or like Louis Vega and and, and the venues. Uh, they want to pay you to okay we'll go it's, it's contractual mm -hmm. you know um, at that time you know you could count the DJs that on one hand who had residencies yeah. you know you know it was Rick Richardson Melons it was David Mancuso it was you know Kenny Carpenter it was you know Tony Humphreys Larry Patterson mm -hmm. you know but it's, it's just, technology is, allows you to, you know, you could be a DJ in your bedroom now, you know, and you don't have to spend the money. You could, I mean, for $1,000, you could have everything you need. Yeah. You know, before it was like, you, you had to drop like six, seven grand mm -hmm. for, for the turntables and the mixer and mm -hmm. the speakers and the isolator. And now it's, anybody yeah. you know and there's 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 more you know it's it's like at an almost critical mass with so many djs mm -hmm. everybody's trying to do something you know it's it's not so much that they're trying to compete with each other they just want to be involved in in it they want to be in it and there's no place there's no venue to be in it you know it's uh like this year the uh they have this thing called a pop conference. Okay. It's to happen, I think, in Seattle. It's, this year is going to be in New York City at um, the Clive Davis um, Institute for Recorded Music in Brooklyn. Okay. I think it's going to happen at NYU at the Tisch. And um, I think they're going to be discussing um, uh, the, the house scene or the dance scene or. or you know, entertainment, something or other. Um, and I was going to be involved in a panel discussion. And I put a dynamite panel discussion together. Mm. I, I put, um, with the help of Carol Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, Who's Carol Cooper? Carol Cooper is a, a journalist and a PhD that works at NYU. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was trying to put it together with her, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, she came up with the idea, and I had the connections. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I said, who are the people to contact? Okay. Joe Cosell, Danny Kirby, Francois, Timmy Redford, Merlin Bob, mm -hmm. you know, Douglas Sherman, David DePino, myself, uh, Stay International. It was going to be a Yvonne Turner. You know, Abigail Adams. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to have a panel discussion. It was going to be like two days, six people on one day. Mm -hmm. But, um, and um, it didn't, you know, NYU couldn't pull it together with the schedule. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't I couldn't hold those guys because it's going to be like my party, Seventh Heaven party is going to happen this April 30th on a Sunday mm -hmm. from 6 to 2 a.m. So we were going to do that in, con in conjunction with the panel and have the, uh, the conference badge holders oh. um, come to the party for free mm -hmm. and experience, 
you know, what we talk about. And, you know, part of the discussion was what's happening to the dance scene in New York City today with the venues and stuff like that. I wanted to get the mayor involved because the mayor's showing interest in what we're doing. He's showing up at a lot of... Uh, Soul Summit, other stuff, yeah. Yeah, he showed up at Sting International's party yeah. in, 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 in Coney yeah. Island. And yeah. um, usually those parties go to like... 7.30, 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. when the mayor came, he extended the party till 11 p.m. Wow. You know, and uh, it was a tremendous success, man. Sting International did a, a wonderful job. I saw the videos, that party was fire. It was, I, I enjoyed myself immensely. You know, it's, Sting is, is one of the person, you know, who he understands what the culture is about. You know, he's younger, but he knows, you know, yeah. and, and uh, he does his job in trying to preserve mm -hmm. what we had, you know? Yeah. And, you know, when he decides to come out, he does it right. Mm -hmm. So I always like going to his events. And, um, but and why you couldn't get it together with the schedule, so I had to pull the plug on that because I, these guys are professionals. They yeah. can't wait around. April is like, that's busy time yeah. for DJs, you yeah. know? So I couldn't hold them to a panel that we weren't going to get paid for in the first place. Yeah. And they were like, oh, we don't know what we're, what we're going to do. So, but we're still having a party. Mm -hmm. And we're still going to allow um, the conference badge holders entry. Okay. You know, because it's important that they understand yeah. what the party atmosphere is about, mm -hmm. you know. And me and Douglas still remember what that is. <laughs> exactly. So, who is the Mike Brody? Who are the Mike Brodies of today? There's no Mike Brody's today. That's that's that's, like, a different that's era. myth. That's legend. Mm. Who's gonna give you a blank? You know? Who's gonna say whatever we need, just make sure it's done? Where do you get that? Mm. Now they're like, you're lucky to walk into a club and they like I said, they have a spare needle. <laughs> you know? I mean David the Pino had with Played at a club where they they only had one turntable. They called him. They hired him for a job. When he came in, they only had one turntable. That's crazy. And you know, like, and it was funny because um, it was a funny story mm -hmm. at the garage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Maybe David's told the story, but um, Richard Long was walking into the garage with a component, electronic component for the console that he wanted to try. Cause he would do that a lot, a lot. just if, if he designed something new or had something he wanted to try, he would bring it. The garage was the show, it was the lab. Yeah. You know, cause uh, Richard Long would bring clients from all over the world to the Paradise Garage mm. and show that room off. Mm -hmm. And, um, so one day he's coming in with something under his arm and uh, Michael Brody just happened to be <laughs> coming out of his office and he caught him and he was stopped. <laughs> Richard, he said, Richard, what is that? And and Richard goes, oh, don't worry about it, Michael. It's just something I want to test upstairs and, you know, don't worry about it. It's nothing. And Michael Brody goes, no, 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 no. no. How much is it? He says, I'm not selling you anything. Rich is going to Michael. I'm not selling you anything. I'm not trying to have you buy anything. It's just something I want to test. He goes, no, because if Larry sees it and he tries it and he wants it, I'm going to have to buy it. So why don't you just tell me how much it costs now? And that's the way Michael was. Whatever the club needed. Yeah. Well, if he, if Because if Larry asked for it, he got it. He got it. You know, and it was amazing, man. Uh, the influence. Who is the heir to Larry Levan's legacy? Uh, Who's the next Larry Levan today? Is there one? Who is the next Larry Levan? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm. I don't know if there is one. Mm. I mean, there's people out there that. Uh, Respect the legacy. You know, like, uh, you talking about, like, when me and David stopped doing the reunions? Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
Like, who's going to carry it forward when you guys decide, all right, I'm tired? Um, doing parties like that, long from beginning to end, there's nobody doing that. I don't know anybody that has more than a two hour set in them. Mm. You know? I mean, just recently, Tyrone Francis just did like a 12 hour party, yeah. which was amazing because I was there. I saw the videos that looked fire. <laughs> it was yeah. there. You know? And, um, you know, there's, there's people out there, you know, Sting International. Mm. He, has, he has the equipment. He has he has the pedigree. Doesn't he also have one of the stacks in the garage as well? I don't know if he has one of the stacks, but they're similar. Okay, gotcha. You know, I really don't know where that stuff went. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, he definitely has the love, and he has he has the education. He has the knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows what the future will, is going to hold after we stop. Mm -hmm. You know. But um, we've been doing it long enough to teach people what it should be, mm -hmm. you know, and that's another reason why, you know, we play what we play and we don't change what we play and because this is what this is about. If you want to hear new music, go hear the other guy. Exactly. If you want to hear classics of what the Paradise Garage was about, then this is what this is about. Don't complain about what you're hearing mm -hmm. when you come here because the Paradise Garage has such a footprint that how could even if you weren't born, how could you not know? All you got to do is Google. Yeah. And you know what it is. So I don't understand what some of these people say. I'm going to ask you a very, very, very controversial question. Oh. Make sure you're sitting down. All right. Vinyl versus MP3. Vinyl versus MP3? Yes. Vinyl. All day. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, there's no question. Why would you even think anything? Yeah. Why would you compare <laughs> vinyl to a compressed digital file? Yeah, All right. You know, if it was uh, like an advanced WAV file, mm -hmm or flack file mm -hmm. or something specialized and trying mm -hmm. to mimic what it sounds like you know what vinyl sounds like mm -hmm. but it's just two different distinct stuff uh, sounds mm -hmm. you know that you can hear and it, it's it's just a preference because I've heard digital stuff that sound amazing mm -hmm. Like when you hear Francois Cavorkian play, mm -hmm. Francois uses um, nothing but the best, cleanest files. Mm -hmm. So he'll come on after some of these young kids playing MP3s, mm -hmm. and then Francois will come on there. He won't be doing anything amazing. Mm -hmm. But his music sounds so much, the quality of it is so much better. Mm. Because, of course, his knowledge mm -hmm. of music and electronics. Mm -hmm. Frank, Francois was the master cylinder of the group. You know, he was always the guy. He was the first guy with a digital camera. <laughs> he was mm -hmm. the first guy. You know, whenever something came out new, mm -hmm. digital, Francois was with it. So. Mm -hmm. He's kind of like the master cylinder, you know, so he's my go-to guy when I need to ask questions mm -hmm. about um, electronics. And Larry loved him, too. They were very close. Mm -hmm. and he was one of the only other DJs that played the most at the Paradise Garage, mm -hmm. you know, as far as guest DJs. Mm -hmm. you know, there have been some guest DJs. David Morales has guested there. Um, T. Scott. Mm -hmm. guested there he didn't you know but he was uh, and T. Scott's an excellent DJ but I mean 
when he blew out them subs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, was, you know, he wasn't invited back, mm -hmm. you know. But it, the Paris Garage was just that sensitive. It didn't have any filters or anything like that. So if you didn't know how to handle the sound system, you was blowing stuff up. Mm -hmm. So you had to know what you were doing. That's why it sounded so good, you know, because the garage was nothing was compressed, mm -hmm. you know, everything was was great. Talk to us about live performances. Is there a live performance that arrived that was really memorable for you? Yeah, there was a few of them, you know. I like uh, that stick in my mind, uh, the Grace Jones performances, you know. The Gwen Guthrie performance, mm. you know, um, Whitney Houston performance, mm. you know. Um, this I could go on, you know. Mm -hmm. There was just they were great, you know. And those those were the nights when the room was so packed that you couldn't even walk across the dance floor. I would have to go out the outside of the club. The oh, oh, <laughs> if I had to get to the other side of the club. It was it was like that. Wow. You know? It was crazy. But they were great. You know, Madonna. You know? What kind of money were they making one night at the garage? At that time, well, you figure, if you do the math, it was $7 for members and $15 for guests. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Getting three thousand people in there, mm. you know, it's a nice little piece of change. I don't want to tell Michael's business. Yeah, but this, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I figure like you know, it's, it's long gone. Everyone's passed away, so I figure it's, it's safe to talk about it. But that's a nice, that's a nice, nice cash, it's nice cash for and it's that right. This is before cash app and it PayPal. It was cash. It was cash. It so. wasn't credit card. Right. We didn't take credit cards. Yeah, you had to come in there with cash. Yeah, you know, that's a nice check in one night. Um, another controversial question. What is Soulful House music? What is Soulful House? Mm -hmm. To me? Yes, to you. Soulful House is music with vocals. Mm. Music that's jazzy. Mm. Music that um, is not banging your head with the tempo mm -hmm. for an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, there's variety. You know, there's 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 up there's ups and there's downs mm -hmm. and there's vocals and there's ballads and there's it's 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 an ebb and flow of mm -hmm. the night. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so full. It's not it's not a techno that you have to stay at this one beat per minute mm -hmm. that you're worried about losing the floor. You know, because you know I remember like when Larry played Heartbeat for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and lost the whole dance floor. Everybody walked off the floor because it was like doo, 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 doo. people didn't were didn't know what that was about, mm -hmm. and they they left the floor. Now today, no DJ would do that. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like what are people gonna say about me if they walk off the floor? The people gonna say, I already cared. Larry will put it on four more times. Mm -hmm. And then what happened after that? There was a line outside Vinyl Mania of people trying to buy the record when they walked off the floor the first time they heard it. Mm -hmm. So the Paradise Garage was responsible for making records. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, um, what's his name? Um, Frankie Krakow is there, you know, two, mm -hmm. three times a month. Right, it's, yeah. He would be in the booth, and then the next, you would hear the music on his show the next day. Right. Frankie was no fool. Mm -hmm. He knew that, you know, if 4,000 people are getting jiggy to, to this track, I'm putting it on my show. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the BLS Frankie show special, man, because he knew where to get music from. You know, you got a good source of and your fingers on the pulse of what the people are doing, mm -hmm. and it's fresh and it's new and nobody's on it. Frank, it was a man. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, it used to, 
I mean, the garage made records, broke records. You know? There's no club, there's no venue, there's no radio station that, that supports music like that anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. It's hard for, for artists these days. It's hard for singers. Now singers, you get a producer who put their name and lights and the singer who wrote the song, singing the song, is this big under when it was the producer that was supposed to be supporting the artist. Mm -hmm. Now it's reversed. Mm -hmm. Now the, the artist has to be like, Oh, well, this guy or this girl is, you know, they got this catalog and they're famous, so if if they produce my record, if they play my record, I'll, it'll be heard mm -hmm. and I'll get some daylight mm -hmm. rather than, oh, this is a great singer. Mm -hmm. Let me put money behind them mm -hmm. and be in the background. Producers don't want to be in the background anymore. They want to be, no. Oh, I found this person, I produced them, I'm the one that you should be looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, things change. Those are the questions that I had. Is there anything that I didn't ask that would help people better understand the Paradise Garage? Well, talk to us about when did you start? Did you DJ at the garage? When did you start DJing? Let me see, I got there in 79. I didn't really start DJing there till like 83. Mm -hmm. Cause just being there with Larry during the week and doing sound maintenance and putting music on for him and uh, and then you know by that time I was playing records at home and mm -hmm. and then sometimes doing he, the record pool he, yeah he would come late or you know or David DePino was like oh you want to play records go ahead I don't mm -hmm. feel like playing right now because Larry's not coming in until three mm -hmm. I started like that. And then Larry sometimes, you know, Larry was very comfortable with us, with me and David DePino, because he knew we weren't trying to steal his job. Right. You know what I'm saying? So he would tell us, like, okay, um, I'm not going to come. I'm not going to be there till this time. There's, all right, the, that creator record, we, there was a creator records that we wouldn't touch to all his new shit. Mm -hmm. He was like, don't touch that record, you know. Sometimes he wouldn't come. It'd be 3 o'clock. I went calling him. was like, where are you? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, I'm cooking pork chops, so I'm cooking steak right now. I, like, I said, if you don't, we were like, if you don't get here within the next 20 minutes, we're going to start playing out of this crate, your crate. And sometimes he would get there in the next, because he lived right on Gold Street. Okay, okay. You know, yeah. in Manhattan. Yeah. Duplex apartment. Mm. You know, deluxe apartment in the sky. That was the kid. Larry was Richie Rich. Mm. I'm telling you. He didn't have to worry about everything. Cause anything. Michael Brody took care of everything. Mm -hmm. For him, everything. Mm -hmm. So imagine, okay, young black gay man in the 70s, mm -hmm. living on Gold Street, mm -hmm. duplex, mm -hmm. all his bills paid, mm -hmm. making $2,000 a week. Mm -hmm. Back then. Back then. <laughs> so, Larry was young. How did Larry process the closing of the garage? Not how good. Did, and how did you all process it? Give me both. Not good, not good. Well, it was announced to us. Michael Brody was sick at the time. You know, he discovered that he had um, um, the autoimmune deficiency disease. Mm -hmm. And um, he um, realized that he wasn't going to be able to continue. So he called a meeting and the whole staff and he start he told everybody you gotta start looking for other jobs and you know, do this, do that, start making moves, making plans because when the lease is up, that's it, the garage this is the date, the garage is gonna close or something. So Larry was in the room with us. He, must he heard that. that for the first time with us. So he was, he didn't take that well at all. Huh. And uh, when he heard that, he got up and left the room, went up to the sound system, and you heard this big explosion. 
boom. It sounded like an earthquake in the sound system. And uh, turned out that he blew every driver in the room. And uh, at that time, those were double 18s, the subs. And it was, it was like 12 of them. So he had to open, I had to open up every box. Take them out, replace them. It was crazy. But the, the, I mean, that was Larry's whole life. Yeah. What are you gonna What are you gonna do? Yeah. You know, and um, at that time, he was abusing. He was substance abusing. Yeah. That didn't help. Yeah. You know, so that he took it really bad, yeah. as anyone would. You know, mm -hmm. when you're sitting, when you're the king for like 10 years mm -hmm. of your game, everybody coming to you, Frankie, the Crocker coming to you, the world coming to you. Ministry of Sound was built after you, you know, because of you. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the footprint, he was the model, he was, you know. And who who owns the Paradise Garage now? Like the the name or the, the logo company? for uh, the Paradise Garage was left to GMHC Gay and Men's Health Crisis. Okay. So um, they own it, the trademark and the Got name. It. And um, Lincoln Center's doing something under the name of Paradise Garage, but it really has nothing to do with Paradise Garage. It's their version of their tribute. Got it. And um, we just recently had to correct them uh, about the use <laughs> and who was supposed to be doing it. Mm -hmm. So we will be doing something, David and myself, with Lincoln Center uh, probably this summer mm -hmm. uh, for Paradise Garage. Oh, that's gonna be bananas. That should be nice, you know. But anybody else that did it before <clears throat> did it without permission, mm -hmm. and they're on notice <laughs> without mentioning any names. You know, they're not trying to start trouble. Exactly, exactly. But we want you to know that the Paradise Garage name and trademark is owned and copyright protected under Gay Men's Health Crisis, GMHC, which was left to them by Mel Sharon for the purpose of service and education of people suffering from that disease called AIDS. And that's the purpose of that logo now, is to, for AIDS awareness, and service to those people that, that suffer from that. You know, so we we don't take kindly to boot legs. If anybody has, has ever seen my posts, if I catch anybody bootlegging, I call you. you out. Exactly. You know, I'll put your picture up. So this is what a bootlegger looks like, mm -hmm. you know. And um, if you get on the garage group page, which I admin, um, with Augie, if you get caught selling bootleg merchandise, you're banned from the group, mm -hmm. and you know you just torn feather you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you gotta respect. You gotta respect that. You exactly. know, you gotta respect it. Thank you so much for the interview. Tell everybody about your party with Doug Sherman in April again. Okay, my party with Doug Sherman is going to occur on April thirtieth of this year it's at the Good Room in Brooklyn. Um, it's going to be from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. and it's going to be Doug Sherman and myself. We'll be, be playing a variety of music from classics to whatever we feel is going to move us that night and um, we hope everybody will come and celebrate with us. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. All right.